Hey everybody, letting you know we're doing a road trip. This is Captain CA on the fly, episode 11. We are in Charleston. Actually, we're in Mount Pleasant, right? I look good in this jacket. Yeah, so uh, stay tuned. We're here for the Hadros Point Tackle uh, Shallow Water Expo. We're gonna be doing a lot of fishing tips. We had breakfast this morning with Brian Latimer, one of the Z-Man pros. And uh, we'll bring you a lot from Charleston and some great food, by the way, as well. Checking out for now. I just finished my seminar up and I've got two of my greatest fans right here. And they're getting ready to step into seminar room number one to listen to Straight Up Fishing with Brian Latimer from FLW. These guys, I get some of my best tips from these two guys. This guy's been fishing for what? How, how many years? Whole life, right? Eight years. Eight years. This guy just got into it. I told him he's not going to have a girlfriend for very long because fishing takes priority. Stand by for more info from both me and these two young bucks. Steve, are you a big Z-Man guy? Big yes. Hadros Point yes. Tackle Center guy? Yes. He was good enough to join me here on episode 11. So stand by for more from some of the young guys that are here, like Steve is number one, here at the Shallow Water Expo for Hadros Point. All right, I'm live here again with my buddy Stephen Black. Yes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, he stopped by our Hell's Bay boat spot here at Shallow Water Expo. And I'm going to make him an honorary captain for clean water. So I'm going to reach up here. And I'm giving Stephen a hat. Stephen is now one of us. You're going to give me that? Good trade, huh? So now, he is a captain for clean water. That's right. We're going to be on epi episode 11. I have my boat, Street Foundation. If you guys want to come, check that out. We'll be here today, tomorrow, and, to and the next day. See you guys here. It's Stephen Black. Thanks. Be sure to go down there and subscribe. Thanks for tuning in to Captain CA on the fly. Steven and I checking out. Hey guys, getting ready to go in seminar room two. This will be my second class today. I want you to come inside and listen to what I have to say. The weight of the lure is too heavy for this rod. Now if I pick up a, a, a top water plug or a suspending plug, let's say that's exactly in the sweet spot for this particular rod, which is, might be three eighths. It might be the standard mirror mullet XL or the mirror mullet itself in the mirror lure lineup to give you an idea and I swing with as much energy and generate the same amount of rod speed, all of a sudden now that lure travels an extra 25 feet because it's designed to throw that weight lure. So to get the most out of the rod, you have to understand what that rod is designed to throw. So you're choosing lures that are based off what your rod is. So when you go into your garage, your tackle shed, or whatever you call it, your man cave, Lay out about a dozen lures that you throw a lot. These are the lures I throw the most. And weigh them on a postage scale. My wife doesn't know I, I put them on the Weight Watcher scale in the kitchen. Don't tell her because there's pretty gross stuff that I'm putting on there. But you weigh them and you make notations on a pad and then you can find out exactly what rod that you probably need to throw most of the time. And that's how you get the most out of the rod and the lure in balanced situations. Most of us like to pick rods that fight the fish for fighting the fish and not casting the lure. But as a plug fisherman, which I generally am most of the time, I always choose a balanced rod for the lures that I'm throwing. This particular one is one that I prefer to throw a lot because it's medium action with a medium flex. It throws mirrodines well, it throws um, most spoons fairly well. Uh, lots of the soft plastics that I like to throw in the quarter inch range, the three eighths inch range, bucktail jigs. So this rod does just about everything I want it to do. So this is a very utilitarian rod that I usually have three or four of these under the gunnels because different different uh, lures are ripped on it. Now, we we spoke briefly in the first, first uh, class about using the heavier actions. This is more of a medium heavy, a lot bigger base here, a lot more meat, better for striking. This is gonna be better for throwing like Texas rig baits. Because a Texas rig plastic, that's where you have a rigging hook and it's rigged weedless, 
you have to move that thicker wire Texas rigging hook through a plastic bait into the fish's mouth for good hook penetration. So you need a lot more backbone to the rod. So this one's a little tighter, it's a little heavier line weight rod, and this is going to be a much better choice for fish in Texas rigs. Lures that are coming right at you, like spoons that have a little heavier wire, these are perfect. Anything with a weed guard, anything that you need to make some impact on a strike, this is going to be a much better choice. So that's how you get, that's the first tip of getting the most out of your cast, is understanding the delivery system and the ability of the rod that you're using. Now in most cases, I use seven foot rods. If you're looking for distance, seven foot six, seven and a half foot rods, seven foot nine rods, seven foot ten rods, those are great. Eight foot rods. I know guys that are making eight foot rods now. For blind casting and getting just distance to cover real estate, that's fine. But what happens when that fish shows up and he's only like 25 feet away and you can see him going down the Spartina grass line? Now you got eight feet of rod, and how are you going to make a nice, smooth, soft cast with an eight foot rod or a seven and a half foot rod? It's a lot tougher seven foot rod gives you that type of latitude. I would rather spend my time carefully positioning my boat where I don't need that kind of distance because I would rather have accuracy over distance most of the time. So can I get any advantage out of using line? You can. The higher quality lines that you can buy in the braid are going to be thinner. They're going to be more expensive and they're probably going to have more carriers or more threads in them because they're going to be more round. Power Pro is cheap. It's cheap. It was one of the first ones out there. It is effective and it works great, but it's a four carrier uh, line is what it is. It only has four threads of spectrum running through it. So it, it's sort of oval in shape and it's not as slick either because it's that way. Now they do make an eight carrier now, but they charge a lot more money for it. So it's more round, it's, full, it's eight strands of spectra and it'll allow a longer cast. Those eight and 12 carrier braids do cast better. They're smoother. If you can find one that's Teflon coated, it'll cast even farther. One of the ones that's sort of a, a jump line according to the Japanese over there <coughs> that I learned is Daiwa Samurai Braid. Have you ever heard of Daiwa Samurai Braid? Braid. J Braid is what they're calling it now, but <coughs> they, have, they have one called Samurai. And that samurai stuff was super expensive, but you could literally gain 12 to sometimes 18 feet on every cast. It was amazing how it would give you an advantage that way. The negative to it was it was a lot thinner, and if you were a cast on bait caster, it would create a lot of backlash issues, or it would get down buried in the spool sometimes when you're fighting heavy fish and end up breaking off. But if you managed to line right, it was a, a superior advantage throwing those higher carrier braids that had that Teflon coating. All that being said, most of the time, I'm just trying to buy line that I can manage for a few weeks and then I pull it all off and I put new line on. I put new line on, with braid, I probably put new line on about every 60 to 90 days. With monofilament, I put it on every week. I tear it, I take it all off and put it all on. Once you catch a few fish, it starts, the, the monofilament starts getting less stretchier, it becomes more brittle, and it's sitting there in salt water, you're reeling salt into the reel all the time, and then it denigrates a little bit just from UV rays sitting in rod holders and stuff like that, so I don't trust it after I've caught a number of fish on it. The braid, you can leave on there for a long time. I know guys leave it on there for a year, but remember, I'm fishing almost every day, and most people are only fishing on the weekend here and there, so braid for you may last a year. Braid for me is like three months. You ever just flip it around on the a spot? Lot. Yeah, yep. yeah. Penny wise, uh, dollar smart. That's true. True. You can you can literally pull it off the end of the tip, run it through another guide, put it on another reel, and reel it on backwards, and put the old line deeper in the spool and have the fresh line on top. And it and that does work, especially if you're trying to save a few bucks. They give me it pretty clear. So. <laughs> I just went through. But a high quality braid will give you give you good distance. Using the right rod in review will also give you better distance and better accuracy, and you won't have to generate all the rod speed and wear yourself out. The way you have to do that is on the casting rod, the line shoots off. On a spinning rod, the weight of the lure and how much rod energy you generate pulls the line off the spool. So there's a helix, that's how the line looks in slow motion. 
when it comes off the edge of the spool? What you have to do is you have to feather the line with your index finger to drop it right where you want it every time. Or you make the hard cast if your fingers aren't long like mine, you make the hard cast and then you feather the bottom of the spool like this, boom, click it, pull the bail over and get your hand right on the reel. That's another way of doing it. Someone who's really good at it. Did anyone listen to Mark Nichols' uh, seminar today from DOA? Mark is one of the best spinner rod fishermen I know, and he does it unconsciously and probably didn't teach it to you. But that guy is amazing with the spinning rod. So casting a, a spinning rod, if you really want to minimize the number of backlash, uh, not backlashes, but wind knots that you get, learn how to feather that line. Because also by feathering that line, you're straightening that line out as it hits the water. And you have less line laying on top of the surface because you feathered it and it fell straight. Now you can, when you get the, the bail over and you start reeling, you're tight immediately to the lure. When you just make a wild cast and you just, whew, and you're watching it and you're like, wow. It goes out there and then you have all this light braid floating over the water. Now it's got this huge parabolic bend in it. And then you're reeling all this loose line up loose, 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 then it gets tight, and then if a fish hits it, it's really tight. Now you got a tight line over loose line, and that's how you get those wind knots a lot, by reeling that loose line up on the spool. So make sure you're feathering it, either with your index finger as it comes off, or here, to slow it down and straighten that line out. I also drop the tip a lot, and that way when I reel the line up, it's nice and tight. It minimizes, minimizes lots of line twist issues. Reeling too fast will also do that too. If you're over reeling, you spin the bait quite a bit. It's better for you if you made a crappy cast. Sorry. Make it, if you make a bad cast, just pop that plastic up on top of the surface and reel it fast over the surface rather than reeling it through the water where it's doing this, creating line twist. Because the way these rods, these reels are designed is they roll the line up this way, but when your bait comes back, it's usually coming the opposite way. So it just keeps twisting that line, twisting that. One of the tricks we used to use is we'd cut the lure off toward the middle of the day and feed the line out the back of the boat when we would idle and it would untwist our line. We'd lead, lit about three casts out, open the bale, and with no lure on it at all, just let the surface tension straighten the line out and then reel it back in, tie the lure back on. Shorten your casting motion. Uh, for better, you'll get greater distance and you'll get more accuracy. It's hard to, this is part of the class I teach outside of my schools. But so many of us want to hold the rod back like this and throw it, you know what I mean? And we have this big arc, which leaves lots of room for things to go wrong. So you can't generate enough speed by throwing it in one direction because you're only loading it in one direction. By being able to make a real short cast where it's just more compact, where it's back a little bit and then shoot, you can throw right to your target, drop your tip and it'll go right in line where you're pointing it. So you want to make the cast more compact. So you pull it back real quick and it stores the energy and then you drive it forward and stop short at 11 o'clock just like a fly fisherman and it unloads that energy and then you follow it with your tip and then you get the accurate cast. That real short casting motion, again, will, will guarantee the perfect cast exactly where you want it. And the better you get with a rod, the more familiarity you have with the rod that you're using, the, the, the more, I mean, you'll get where you can put it right where you want it every time. So you have to really focus on that a lot. For me, I choose a bait caster for, and people will ask this question, but why do you use a bait caster? Why do you use a bait caster? No one uses a bait caster. You throw it farther with a spin rod. You can, but you cannot cast with the same amount of accuracy. With a spinning rod, um, you're usually throwing over the top and you're trying to stay square to your target. With the bait caster, if I see a fish right there and I'm facing this way, I don't want to shift my weight and the fish blow off the bank because I had to shift my weight with a spinning rod to throw it perfectly right on. But with a bait caster, if I'm standing here and see one there, I can just flick it backhanded and it will go right where I want it to go and it'll be nice, low trajectory, fall right where I want it to fall. Same way with the left hand side. That's why I use that all the time. A shorter rod delis delivers a very smooth cast. It's very controlled. And I would rather spend my time putting my, my boat or my skiff in perfect position to catch fish rather than 
thinking that I'm going to make a three-point jump shot all the time, I would just rather make a layup. I'd just rather be in close and make a standard, you know, Bobby Knight bank shot off the bank door than you guys can do. Uh, I don't want to have to make a long pass. So that's why I use it. But to, everyone uses a spinner rod. They're easy to use. They don't backlash. They're, they're great tools. You just got to understand how to throw them. So with a spinning rod, you have to be a little bit more patient, but that short, compact cast will allow you to make some of those casts. And even learning how to, to swing the bait so that, this is that Texas style that I was telling you about. Learning how to swing that bait so that you can make underhand casts. Lots of times you can just make a, a slick little drop like that and you can drop it right on a fish without having it. It's hard to cast to a fish with a seven foot spinning rod that's that close to you. But if, but if you sit there and you just pitch it, a lot of the pitching stuff can be done where you can just drop it and you can drop it right up underneath the dock. You can just make those soft little pitches and they work perfectly. And a lot of the fishing that we do in Louisiana is done that way. You know, without this action rod, you just drop it right on your hip and catch them. If you had to cast over it, and I'll watch clients, they'll sit there and they're trying to make an accurate cast 15 feet away for one of those redfish and they can't do it. But as soon as you show them how, to, how you just pendulum out there, use the rod tip to lift the bait, and then drop it right on them, they're like, oh, well that looks easy. You gotta practice a little bit to make it look easy. But if you practice a little bit, you'll catch a lot of fish. One of the big tips also for distance, if you're looking for that distance, is to follow, follow, the, uh, follow the lure in the air. So you make this great, compact cast where it's But if you stop the rod right here, just the friction between the braid and the tip will make the lure fall faster. So once you load, unload, follow the lure, and then you take the resistance off the tip and you get that extra 10, 15 feet that you might need to reach the spot. A lot of the, the stuff I teach in some of the bigger fishing schools is smart casting. So, if you're a good athlete, or you got good hand-eye coordination, or like myself, you spend a little time at the bar, <laughs> hand-eye coordination is really good. So you play darts better than everybody else, you shoot pool better than everybody else, because your hand-eye coordination is fixed, so you can do it. The problem with that is your eyes and your hands get so good at seeing things and throwing to them that you blow fish out when you're sight fishing. You know the fish is sitting right there in that pocket. You saw his tail come up one time, you know he's right there. Don't throw right there. Take your eyes and move them 15 feet further down. But you know it's in line. So it's like playing that combination billiard shot. So what you're doing is you're like, eh, if I put it back there, then I can run right by him and I won't blow him out. So then you make the smooth cast to the back behind him, and then you reel it through that way, lure hits the water, you start getting it quickly into a rhythm where it's starting to swim through, and by the time it gets to the zone where the fish is set up, it's perfect. It's running through there just right, and he's going to hit it. Rather than you going, and he's gone. That's what you got to think about. So you, it's called smart cast. I coined the phrase, feel free to place your eyes. <laughs> they just always hit the fish, right in the head, right in the tail, right in the back. Then I learned that you know, if you give it a little bit of forgiveness and use a little Kentucky windage, put it right in the right spot, you reel it right by his head, and he'll, it, then it's his idea. Anytime you make it the fish's idea, a lot like dating. It's gonna work out for you. Same. That's, that's really the trick, um, is, to, is to understand what the fish sees. Uh, Cameron's been great for me the last, the last year or two, I've, I've had him chase baits down with a GoPro in the water. And I, I mentioned this in the first class a little bit. It, it's fantastic to see what the fish see. Because what you see the bait doing from this end versus what the fish sees when he's chasing it is two different, two different things. For him to, to, to see the paddle tail, it's amazing. The less action you put on the bait, the better, the more appealing it is to the fish because it's not moving wildly. Most of us run the lure too fast, give the rod tip too much action, and it makes the bait do these crazy wild things that a real natural bait really doesn't do. 
until the last minute. But by using, you know, a more subtle approach so that when you're reeling that bait, you're just shaking the tip as you're reeling it, shaking the tip as you're reeling it, instead of going these wild hops, you know, where it goes completely out of their eyesight. They don't even see it, it's out of their viz now. It's like, wow, he was here, he's gone. Where'd he go? But by using rods that are more in the medium action, uh, scope of rod actions, when you flinch them a little bit, the rod sort of dampens how far that bait jumps out of the way and it keeps it right in front of them all the time. So I use a lot of medium light and a lot of medium action rods, or what I like to call Texas actions. I used to always make fun of those guys on how soft those rods were. I was like, God, I can't believe they use these rods. They're so soft. They look like they bend in the cork. But it, it controls how caffeinated they can really work the bait, and it gives the bait tons of action with very little forward movement. So I learned something from those guys wearing cowboy hats. It actually works. Uh, that that little trip or tick, uh, tip right there will will put a lot more fish in your boat. Just trying to keep it as static and natural disciplines. I think I have one of those cards here that Cameron is selling for us. If you've ever seen these, it gives the retrieve disciplines right on the back of the card. And one's going to be natural rhythm, one's going to be a wounded rhythm, and one is more of like you're riding the current or you're dead sticking a bait. Uh, the natural rhythm is something that the fish would expect to see and when there's not a whole lot going on that's that's what you want to run uh, if a fish is laying here a speckled trout he's pretty aware of everything going on and he sees a bait swim by a paddle tail and it's just cruising by like that or maybe he sees a mirrodine flash flash he'll probably go out there to it but if he sees something hot, you know just bouncing around like it's it's had too much coffee he's probably going to go that way he's like that guy's not right i'm going that way and that's what they do now if you had tons of bait around and there's mullet jumping everywhere and there's other trout feeding and they hear things and there's all kinds of noise going on or or some big current or something like that then you need to provide that wounded that wounded discipline so what i've done is i've created a reference card that you can clip and put on your tackle bag and it's waterproof so that you can go, oh, what should I be, what color should I be using? What speed should I be working the bait? There's always buts in this, you know, but the water's cold, you know. We, try, we tried to adjust a lot of this stuff, law of thirds. The law of thirds was something I just, I totally made up. It's just something that, you know, one third of the days in the month, fishing sucks, it just does. Nothing's right. Ten days out of thirty suck. One third of the month things are perfect. Everything's great. You catch fish, you can't do any wrong. And one third, you just gotta work at it and you'll catch a few. That's that's the way life is in general. But I started thinking about it in relation to tides. I was like, well, the lowest third of the tide is always the easiest water to locate fish because there's not a lot of tide moving and there's not a lot of places they can be. So that's the biggest base on the triangle. That's the, that's the best time to fish. So you should be fishing during the best time. And then the middle third was when the flow was gonna be the best. Now where I come from in St. Pete, Tampa, that's what you want because we have these big expansive flats, clear shallow water, and the only way to get any energy on the flats at all is to have that middle third. Here, where you guys got these giant six foot tides, well that's when the water is moving so fast, it's dirty. And, and, and you, it's hard to target the fish, it, it truly is. You're always running to the slow water here, which brings me to the smallest part of the triangle, which is the high tide. Now, some of us have really good high tide spots, but the more water you add to the equation, the, the farther away the fish can go. They can go further up in the grass, they can go further up in a creek. It starts to dilute the possibilities. So that's the smallest part of the triangle, my least favorite tide to fish. But on occasion, the butt, There'll be a big oyster mound where they like to pile up on top of at the highest tide, or there'll be a little pocket in the back of this Spartina plain of grass that floods during that one time there's fiddler crabs in there, and the whole school of reds are in there. So if you know one of those, that's your high tide play, and you can actually play it during the weakest part of the tide. So it, there, there's just some logic to it. Um, 
and a, and a lot of these apply to just not my area, to all areas. So if, if you're looking for a cheat sheet, if you will, these things are for sale and uh, on the website and you can, you can get them. I think Cameron's gonna sell some of those right here out there by the Hells Bay Boat Works display that we have out here with the Captains for Clean Water Boat. So you're more than welcome to go out there and look at some of them. Uh, it's just common sense stuff, it's logic. It's just my logic when I'm on the water, that's the way my brain works. It works in like flow charts and yours will too. Mine works a little faster because I'm on the water all the time. And I've been doing this for 30 something years. But if you understand um, the way fish see things and the way you can make mechanically yourself a better angler, a lot of this stuff come, comes into play the colors that you should be choosing, the time of day you should be using them. And that was a lot of stuff we talked in the very first class. Well, that concluded day one here at the Hadrill's Point Shallow Water Expo. Some great classes. Hopefully I taught you guys an awful lot today. Uh, I know you sat through one of my classes, the second one, and I met some incredible people. I really did. Brian Latimer, uh, some folks that I gave some great advice to and bought a couple of my custom rods. And I met a lot of young people today that really left an impression with me. Catch you on the next one. Captain C.A. Richardson on the fly, checking out.